This is Brandon M. Crooker, and you're listening to the Apostolic Theory Podcast. We have a very special guest with us. This has been uh, sort of uh, quite a while in the making. Uh, we have Reverend Good Brother John Carroll with us today. I'm super excited about this. Um, if you've never heard this man preach, you need to you need to find some of his content somewhere because uh, this guy, I'm telling you, he's just got an incredible uh, view of of scripture, just incredible understanding, just you know, just a great man, great great guy. Uh, <clears throat> Brother Carol, would you just uh, introduce yourself, tell the listeners a, a bit about you, uh, and then we'll get right into uh, the conversation at hand. Well, I have um, I have been preaching since I was, I think, sixteen. I grew up um, I grew up in a pastor's home, Louisiana, Faraday, Louisiana, uh, which was also the hometown of Jerry Lewis, Mickey Gilly, and Jimmy Swaggart. And um, my dad pastored there for uh, 18 and a half years. And then when I was 10 years old, he started evangelizing. And um, so I spent I spent my life from 10 till about 19 um, as an evangelist kid. And um, then after my dad took a church in Columbia, Tennessee, I started traveling on my own and uh Throughout uh, the years, just a, a series of of a full time ministry, and now my wife and I are in Youngstown, Ohio, church planting. We have been church planting. It will in March will be three years, and uh, so that's kind of where we're at right now. I also just recently this year graduated with a with a. Um, BA in Biblical and Theological Studies from Regent University, and I am currently uh, working on a master's in Biblical Languages at Liberty University. Wow. Busy man. Uh, church so, planting. And wow. Church planting full-time, work full-time, school full-time. So my wife's also in school full-time, so she's in a master's program in uh, clinical mental health at liberty also so so you know as a church planter um this is i i feel like this isn't your first time church planting either no it isn't no i church planted um i church planted in alton illinois um 20 something years ago awesome um, uh, I mean, in, in that sort of realm of, uh, church planting and, and, and uh, discipling, and, uh, having Bible studies and things like that, you know, you come across a lot of, uh, a lot of flawed theology, things that just yeah. aren't biblical, aren't scriptural, you know, uh, yeah. and I, I think this might be a very good segue right into, uh, our conversation, um. Uh, you know, it's just it's it's just so important that um, we have, first of all, that's being preached from a pulpit. You know, you've got to yeah. you, you've got to have that foundation. You know, it, it's great to preach a message that that encourages somebody, you know, that, that makes them feel good. And then, I mean, that's great. But you've got to have that foundation, that that sort of understanding. And I understand a, a pastor can only fit so much into their one to two hour time slot um, that they get, whether it be twice on Sunday and once on Wednesday or however, you know, uh, churches do their services. But, you know, there's got to be a deeper uh, training, whether it be, you know, different types of, of schooling or uh, schooling at your local church and things like that. I mean, um, I was involved in, uh, the UPCI has this thing called Purpose Institute, and yes. I did that. I did that for a while. Um, I was spending a lot of money doing it. Uh, I would like to see, and I kind of have this vision, uh, and I might be crazy, but I have this vision. And I started Purpose Institute for a while. Uh, it cost a lot of money. It ended up costing a lot of money, and uh, I was being 
taught stuff I already knew. So that was frustrating. Uh, but, you know, the idea is tremendous. The idea of having this sort of <coughs> informal training setting and sessions. Yeah. Uh, so I have, I have this vision and uh, I'm hoping within the next few years if the Lord tarries, we'll be able to see that vision come to life, but um, of a schooling, an online schooling that is completely free, uh, that has meaningful, you know, biblical truth teaching uh, that is based on scripture, uh, that's 100% apostolic. Uh, that's kind of my idea. Uh, it's been my vision for a while. And I just, I've had I've talked to a few people about doing uh, classes and most people that have said they'd do it, I uh, just haven't really had the time. And so I, I get that, but, but yeah, that's my vision because I think it's so necessary. Um, Absolutely. So why don't you share your thoughts on it? So, yeah, I mean, um, I think purpose Institute um, is, is very helpful. Um, I have a friend of mine. You're probably familiar with uh, Jason Weatherly. Yes, he, sir. Uh, he teaches a purpose Institute at um, his church and I think a couple other uh, campuses as well. And uh, so I think purpose Institute can, can be awesome. And especially for <clears throat> equipping, equipping saints in a church that academia is not there, like what they're, you know, pursuing or going after, but simply want a, uh, a great foundational uh, understanding of scripture, understanding of basic doctrines. I think Purpose Institute is is fantastic, and like you said, for you, it was stuff that you already already knew, and for the most part. So, uh, but there are there are a lot of saints that benefit, and I think uh, I think the level of uh, uh, the level of how it benefits someone uh, can often depend on who their professor is, who their teacher is for Purpose Institute. Like I know Jason Weatherly, he uh, he's in a PhD program. And so uh, I guarantee you <laughs> this, the students that go through Jason Weatherly's class is getting a, a first class education in theology. Yeah. Uh, uh, Cause he doesn't, he doesn't spare any, uh, any effort in what he teaches in his classes. So the people there in Cabot, Arkansas, who are doing, going through Jason Weatherly's uh, Purpose Institute classes are, are getting a really good look at, you know, Pentecostal theology. Yeah. Right. And uh, so, yeah, I think it's important. I really do think that uh, it's important for, for saints, not just ministers to have, a basic understanding of scripture, how it's put together, how to interpret scripture, how to read scripture. And uh, I've been through multiple rounds of hermeneutics class with the the members of, of the church that I pastor. And so um, I think it's so important for, for uh, Christians at every level to have a, a fundamental understanding of hermeneutics. How do you think that as a, as a whole, um, you know, how there's, we recognize that there are some, uh, churches and, and some, maybe even organizations, smaller ones that maybe haven't, um, uh, embraced this idea, uh, where they feel like higher, uh, higher learning is, it's just, you know, that we're supposed to just kind of be, you know, like Peter, you know. There, there, there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of um, church cultures who n not only don't promote higher or formal education, they actively oppose it. They they preach against it as being carnal and sinful and inevitably leading to compromise. Even if even if you go to a you know an apostolic Bible college, you know where I was raised up, we were we were against every form of Bible college, including, you know, the apostolic ones that existed at the time, you know, by me, it was, 
JCM and Jackson College of Ministries in Jackson, Mississippi. And so, you know, that was that was just a breeding ground for compromise and backsliding where I come from. So, yeah. yeah. You know, you, you Why do you think that is? Well, in your in your opinion, obviously, it's oh, well, our only opinion. But why do you think there are so many people? Because I've seen it too. That are are against uh, these formal training set, settings. You know, because how is it really any different than having a discipleship program in your church with a a well, leader who's you know the way it, yeah the way it's different is that the pastor doesn't get to control the content that you read and and learn and what's taught to you and so for where i came from the local pastor didn't want you consuming any information that disagreed with local church standards local church culture and to any other voice other than his as the man of god in your life and so if you listen to a professor or you listen to you know someone outside of his voice that was you know that was very frowned upon because he is the man of God in your life. And there should be no other voices that you listen to, uh, you know, for theology or for anything of that nature. And so I think it was a, a distorted and um, overbearing uh, perspective of pastoral authority that, that refused to, to let, let people, you know, engage in formal academic settings. So I think it's important uh, where you you talked a little bit about that to say, you know, I think it was Paul and he's writing about the responsibility of the pastor. And it's interesting because it actually says not to lord over them. Yeah. yeah. So this idea that uh, I love my pastor, so I don't want to give a, a mixed sure. idea here, you know, and and. I often go to him for advice about things and, and, and feel, but he, he would never say this is what you need to do or else he just wouldn't mm -hmm. do it. Cause that's not yeah. the way he operates. Um, but he knows that if he said, if I came to him for advice and, and said, Hey, he knows that I high, uh, I hold his authority yeah. in my life in a, in a place, in a position that, if he said that I shouldn't do something or I shouldn't go somewhere, I'm going to respect that. I'm going to honor yeah. that. He's my watchman, right? Yeah. But being a watchman, you, you have to understand that, for instance, in culture, you know, you're talking about the watchman on the wall. They're watching for uh, people that come and go. But here's the thing. That didn't stop the doors from opening and closing, did it? That didn't no, stop no. people from buying and selling and conversing with the community and other communities. That's it didn't right. stop that from happening. What their responsibility is, is to look for danger and yeah. to protect, right? So, yeah. you know, as a pastor, you know, it's not their responsibility to be lords, but to be uh, their, their protectors, their shepherds, their watchmen, their, their looking, their their protecting and they're helping and leading and guiding but that doesn't shouldn't come at the expense of you know their ability to operate first of all in the spiritual realm or to operate as the body of christ because they all have their own ministries that they need to be able to fulfill yeah. and if you're lording over it and keeping them back i mean phew, we won't get into too much of that maybe that'll be another episode but yeah i man yeah i completely agree and, and what's so interesting is you know uh, with that whole concept of lording over God's heritage, <clears throat> that should be something that oneness Pentecostals are to be particularly careful of as we place a, a strong emphasis on there only being one Lord. So when, when a pastor lords over the one Lord's heritage, he, it is a, it is a frontal assault on the oneness of God. It is a frontal assault on the Shema wow. because we believe that the one Lord is the, you know, is the Lord of his own heritage. And when a leader puts himself in the position to Lord over the one Lord's heritage, it is, it's, it's a challenge an affront to the, to the oneness of God. And it sets up um, a system of idolatrous ministry, which is so, so incredibly 
dangerous to do. And unfortunately, I feel like if you were to visit a lot of churches, it's very prevalent. Oh, absolutely. It's, and as a pastor, you know, I, I pastor a church, so I, I encourage people to get education. And, and so be, one reason is, is I'm confident enough in what I believe that, you know, if someone does have questions or someone does hear information that, um, you know, that conflicts with, you know, biblical teaching that I've, I'm confident enough in, in the word of God that I feel like I can appropriately and adequately address those issues and concerns. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, yeah, go ahead. I know. I was just going to say that. And the other thing is, you know, as a, as a pastor, I'm not going to make every issue a hill to die on. I'm not going to make every everything I believe, like my views on eschatology. Nobody in my church has to hold my views on eschatology. Nobody has to agree with me on eschatology. That's not an issue that is important enough that everybody has to hold my view on it. And so within my local church, a person is free to be pre-meal dispensational. They're free to be, you know, pre-meal post-trib. Um, they're they're free to hold pr pretty much any variation of of eschatology, at least any variation of eschatology that holds to a future physical bodily uh, second coming of Christ and resurrection right. of the dead. Right. To me, those are the essentials of eschatology, and and if you hold that, then the timeline and the timeline and how things unfold, you know, uh, I don't I don't care what someone believes. So so. Uh, you know, one of the things is for me is to, to narrow down what the essentials are and for all the things that are non-essentials, you know, it, it just doesn't matter if a, if a young man goes, you know, goes away to Bible college and comes, comes home with a different view of eschatology than me, I'm not going to be insulted, offended, or feel slighted because he doesn't agree with my position on it. Right. Yeah. So uh, what I was just, what I was going to say is, in, in this in this realm of pastors preaching, even when you come down to standards, right? Yeah, I hold the belief that because here's the thing: my youth group. I think right now my personal youth group, the ones I grew up with, I think five of them out of like a hundred are even serving God today. Wow. The question is: is 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 why? Is yeah. it because they desired sin? Is it because they desired the world? Or was it a lack of knowledge? Was it yeah, a lack exactly. of teaching and understanding? Yeah. Were they just doing things because they were told to do it? And I saw right. it time and time again where it was, this is what you do. And there was never the explanation of why. That's right. And that's well, show me in scripture where this is this is what the scripture says. This is what the scripture teaches. And I believe that there's a certain spirit. That is behind certain, like for instance, if you don't watch TV and there's a spirit, I, I believe that there's a spirit behind a lot of what's going on in television, and yeah. nobody really can deny that. But does that yeah. mean that you can cut out all the all the good because of the little bad? Yeah, that's right. And uh, yeah, that's that's exactly right. And it's so important because not even a lot of pastors. And I think this is where the problem is rest is not a lot of pastors themselves are equipped to even teach their, their, their churches and their ministers and their laity uh, basic principles of hermeneutics because they don't even know it themselves. Hmm. And so they can't teach what they don't know. And I'm almost to the place. Of course, I, I started preaching when I was 16. Um, obviously, no formal, you know, college education or formal training in theology or hermeneutics or anything of that nature. And I, I don't think it's essential, obviously, to be called or used of God to have a have a formal degree. But <laughs> uh, I'm almost to the place to where, man, I, I think I think a uh, a preacher that is going to make a living and a career out of preaching and teaching God's people, the word ought to at the very least, you know, have a, have a bachelor's level understanding of theology. Even if they just go find the course 
material for uh, a bachelor's degree and and read that content and and study that content, you know, at least have some good basic understanding of hermeneutics. Because I, I hear so much preaching that I hear so much preaching that absolutely demolishes any kind of principles of of properly exegeting a text of scripture. And it's just like if you had if you would have had one class in hermeneutics, you wouldn't have said that. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. And right. I, and and so so you know we we can't blame the laity for being ignorant whenever you know a lot of times the the clergy the ministry are not equipped to even even teach them and and that's different in in various segments of of Christianity thank god for the UPC you know thank god for their emphasis on education and with UGST and TBC and and uh, other institutions that they are that they have to promote education, and the desire with Purpose Institute to educate the laity, I think it's incredible. Uh, right. You know that that emphasis, and so, but it has to start with leadership of churches. If you are going to lead people in God's Word, there needs to be a proficiency in Scripture demonstrated. You must be, according to the Apostle Paul, you must be apt to teach. Whew. You have to be capable of teaching. You have to be able able to teach. And if you, and if you can't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how good of a man you are, how much you pray. Uh, if you're not capable of teaching Scripture, capable of communicating the Word of God, you're not qualified for for pastoral or leadership ministry in a position to where you are responsible for feeding the flock of God. It is a qualification. It is a requirement, just as much as being the husband of one wife. You have to be apt to teach. You right. have to be capable <clears throat> of teaching Scripture. Absolutely. Um, and there's some denominations, like there, there's some denominations. You can't even apply for the pastorate of a church if you don't have a graduate level degree in theology. If you don't have at least an MDiv, you you can't pastor a church in in a lot of mainstream denominations yeah i'm not saying we should go there i'm just saying (laughs) i'm not saying we should go there i'm just saying we need Uh, to do better at equipping you know at least at least graduate from purpose institute you know at least go through that i'm not even sure how long that program is is it a two-year program or uh I think if you if you cut it up into all the different semesters, there's like twelve or fourteen different semesters, um, and I mean they're they're only like four or five week courses okay. that you go and do, you know, every weekend, you know, for a short certain period of time. Okay, um, well, it's a couple yeah. years. It's a couple yeah. years. I think yeah. I think every preacher, I think every preacher should. I mean, at you least don't have to. That's the thing. That's the thing. You don't have to commit a whole lot of time to it. You get it's one weekend, uh, uh, you know, uh, four weekends. I think you yeah. know uh, per semester. Yeah, for per semester, and so and there's a lot, a lot of great content, you know, yeah, in, cool. in it. And so, um, and for what it is for the tr- for the for the for the material, um, you know, for the knowledge that you can receive. Uh, obviously, it's cheaper than going to. Texas Bible College, right, yeah. or anywhere else where the how much you pay per class and for room and board and your food and all these other things. Yeah, you know, it uh, significantly lower and uh, more time respective. Yeah, um, but yeah, so and, and you know, to me, it, it, when you take a look at the the uh, the New Testament specifically and the authorship of the New Testament and the education of the New Testament authors, it becomes very clear that a person who has formal education of some sort is, is going to be more effective, more effective and more equipped at doing, (laughs) doing something as spiritual as writing scripture. Because, you know, we, we often say, and this is, this is something that uh, is a tiny pet peeve of mine. 
we we often say that the apostle Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament or two thirds of the New Testament, uh, which which isn't true. Actually, Luke wrote more of the New Testament than Paul did. If you do it by the amount of words that are contributed uh, to the New Testament, obviously Paul wrote more books than Luke did. But Paul, but Luke wrote more of the words a higher percentage of the of the words of the New Testament than what Paul did. So when you combine Luke and Acts, which is, you know, Acts 1, Acts 2, they're actually the same book that's divided up into two parts. It's a two-volume work of Luke. Uh, that Luke actually wrote more of the New Testament than Paul did. But Paul wrote more, you know, more books of the New Testament. Yeah. But when you when you put Paul and Luke together, you have the overwhelming bulk of the percentage of the new testament and luke was a physician so he had formal educational training uh to be to be a physician and then paul was schooled in theology so the the two guys that contributed the the overwhelming bulk of of the new testament were educated they were formally right. educated men and so education and ministry is going to give you give you the ability and the framework to be used of God in a in a particular way in a specific way that that without that training you're not going to have that framework for God to be able to use you in particular ways and areas of ministry absolutely and so <clears throat> that's why it's so important um you know for for pastors, really, I think the entire fivefold ministry ought to be able to, you know, because if you're a prophet and you're prophesying and what yeah. you prophesy doesn't align with the word of God, doesn't yes. align with principles that that God has, has taught you from Genesis to Revelation, yeah. then, you know, somewhere along the way, we miss the mark, right? And we, yeah, and, and the Apostle Paul tells us we are to judge prophets, like to, to judge prophecy. And if there's not an underlying foundation of scripture, how can the church effectively judge prophecy without that fundamental grounding in scripture? Right. And, Absolutely. And, and so deception happens when false prophets are able uh, to deceive God's people when they prophesy falsely because the, 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 the people don't have a grounding in scripture that makes them capable of judging prophets and judging prophets well, right so let's give it let's give us probably the most foundational uh what the bible says that no man knows the day or the hour that the lord cometh yeah if no man knows why have so many people flocked to all these people that said he's coming this year he's, <laughs> and then they sell all they have they leave their businesses they leave their wives they do all this crazy out of this world stuff why because they didn't they didn't have that foundational understanding and too yeah. many christians go to church and think that that's all they need and they never open the bible in their home yeah and and you know paul says to the galatians uh galatians 1 6 and 7 though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel than that which we have preached unto you you know you let, let him be accursed accursed so yeah. but but he's writing to the laity of the the the, the saints at the church of Galatia. Right. So he's challenging them. You let the teacher that brings another gospel be a curse. How is that laity equipped to do that? Not with spiritual mm -hmm. gifts, but with revelation and understanding of scripture. The only way they can be equipped to, to, to do that and to judge preachers and teachers, even an angel from heaven is is a is a foundational revelation of, of what scripture says so how can in your in your opinion how could how could a church that may feel like they're struggling in this area how how could they i mean we talked about purpose institute but before you take that next step where you're doing formal training or bible colleges yeah right there at the home church what what is one thing that you feel like pastors could do or facilitate so to enhance the, the process 
there, there is a incredible hermeneutics textbook that I, I used um, for one of my bachelor's level classes for hermeneutics. It's called grasping God's word. And uh, it's an incredible, incredible uh, introduction to hermeneutics that anybody can work their way through. And so I would just encourage pastors everywhere uh, you know, to buy a textbook like that, to buy a, it's a college textbook, but it's very accessible. It's not like a PhD level course where you have to know Greek and Hebrew to be able to, to function in it. It's, it's very, uh, uh, it's very accessible. And so I would encourage pastors to, to get a book like grasping God's word, go through it personally, then take the time to take all the men in your church or, or women, cause I'm pro women in ministry. I believe in women preachers. So take all of the all of the uh, people in your church that's interested in, in preaching and teaching and pulpit ministry, go through it with them. And after you've gone through that book with them, you know, open it up to the congregation. And if need be, you know, take a take two months of Wednesday nights and and teach the content, engage with the content. And uh, I, I mean, you know, preachers teach series all the time. What better, what more fundamental series mm -hmm. to teach in a church than how to read scripture? Wow. Yeah. Right. It's like we, we teach series all the time about, you know, a wide range of topics. Why not take two months and teach a series on how to read scripture, how to interpret scripture? Right. Yeah. And I, th I think sometimes, I think sometimes that some pastors don't want their 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 church members, their saints, to have that level of understanding of you know how to to interact with the Word of God. Absolutely. And so, what a shame. So yeah, I mean, I th I think um, I think uh, you know having some sort of structured. Um, Education in, in scripture is so important uh, to someone who is, you know, intending to teach the word of God to other people and to be taught uh, and equipped to be able to teach others. Well, look at it this way. If 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 we're all called to be ministers of the gospel, we're yeah. all called to minister. We're all ministers. We're all as the church, the people. Um, uh, pastor, evangelist, prophet, teacher, or yeah. not. If you reside in the church, in the body of believers, you've been born again. You're you're a believer. You're the body of Christ. Yeah. You have a responsibility to reach your world and reach your community. And we talk we talk a big game about teaching Bible studies. And we have a lot of great Bible studies programs that you can purchase um, from a wide array of different uh, apostolic Pentecostal organizations. But when it comes, what it comes down to is if you're going to teach somebody else, you need to know what you're teaching, why you're teaching yeah. and the importance of what it is that you're teaching and why it's so fundamental. If yeah. you, if you tell somebody that it, they need to be baptized, but you never tell them why, the yeah. Bible says you've got to be baptized. Why? For the remission of your sins. And it's not you going in the water. It's 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 it's, it's a supernatural thing that takes place when you go under the water that the blood of Jesus Christ washes away your sins. It's not the water, it's the blood yeah. that gets applied when you apply his name. Now you go down to I personally believe that if I'm gonna baptize somebody, I'm not only gonna call on the name of the Lord. I'm going to have them call on the name of the Lord yeah. because in my understanding of, because there's a point where he says he baptized them in the name of Jesus Christ, calling on the name of the Lord. Yeah. So I need to apply it. They need to apply it. It gets applied. Right. Yes. And if you do it different, I mean, that's, that's between you and you and God, but that's the way yeah. I do it. Uh, but that's my understanding. Yeah. And so when you, when you're teaching other people to do, you've got to teach them why. And here's the thing. Not only pastors should be baptizing people. Yeah. Show, how do you think 
2,000 people were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ in one day, if only two or five or 12 people were baptizing. Yeah, it wasn't just one guy doing it, that's for sure. Yeah, I think if you do that math, that if, if just the 12 disciples were baptizing, yeah, if you do that math, that that would and, and the time it takes it, it yeah. say let's say you dunked them in five minutes you know you know you you, you said your spiel you, you, you they go under and you know then but then you have to figure you're praying for them to get the Holy Ghost so yeah. you go through this whole deal which which could take anywhere from I, I people get the Holy Ghost sometimes in thirty minutes and sometimes they get it in three but you know everybody's different because they have that different level of understanding that different level of surrender and. If I could tell you the amount of times people have come up to try and get the Holy Ghost, and it just frustrated me so much because I was like, somebody needs to tell them that if they don't open their mouth, they're not going to get the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Your tongue has to be moving. You have to be fully surrendered for God to take control. The Bible says that the tongue is the most unruly member. Who can tame it? Well, we know that the God who created it is the only one that can. Yeah. Man, so so man, um, having having a understanding of scripture, having good good um, grasp of how the how the Bible works is so absolutely essential to fundamental, absolutely uh, to Christian maturity to um, to ministry, and you know not just education and theology, but um, I think. Um, it's important to have education in, in various levels of life because not everybody's called to preaching ministry. Not everybody's called to a word ministry or pulpit ministry. And so, you know, having people having, having, um, you know, formal education in, in, in pharmacy and psychology and, and, you know, various other areas of, um, you know, academic pursuits. I think the people of God ought to be among the leaders in all the industries and culture. And so, you know, just not just theology, but, you know, you know, having the training, you know, the education to be doctors and to be lawyers and to be, you know, various professions and, and, and pursuing and having education to be the best that we can be for the glory of God, I think is so important. Amen. And so as, as, we, as we sort of draw this this meeting to a close yeah what is i mean we've talked about a lot and it's just a lot of great content in here uh, i know somebody's going to be blessed by it uh, you know radically transformed i believe you know encouraged they're they're going to be empowered you know they're going to they're going to know that there's some next steps they need to take uh but what what is one thing everything else we've said what's one thing you want them to walk away from this episode with well, you talked about uh, you talked about you, you know earlier um, knowledge and understanding, and I think um, I, I recently taught to our church two Sundays ago um, uh, from a from a message that I used to preach called "Do I Look Stupid?" and uh, but you know the the text that we often quote: "My people are destroyed." for lack of knowledge. And um, the rest of the verse goes on to say that because you have, you know, forgotten my law, I will mm. forget your children. Wow. And so the, the idea of my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And that is the only time in scripture that I can think of where God says what can destroy his people. And when he says what can destroy his people, he never considers the enemy, the situation, the circumstance, the adversity. He never says any of those things can destroy his people. The only thing that God says can destroy his people is a lack of knowledge. And so there's a text in Proverbs. I forget the exact location right now. But it says, through knowledge shall the just be delivered. Wow. Wow. And so one text says that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. The other text says through knowledge, the just shall be delivered. 
And so the only difference between destruction and deliverance is knowledge. Wow. With knowledge, you're delivered. I'm going to use it. <laughs> Without knowledge, you're destroyed. Yeah. And so grow in knowledge and um, get a found, foundational, fundamental understanding of Scripture, how it works. If you can't get that from your local church, buy a good hermeneutics book. Get uh, Grasping God's Word. Take personal responsibility for your understanding of Scripture. And and uh, and then outside of that, if you're pursuing, uh, uh, if you're pursuing wanting to go into to the medical field and be a nurse or a doctor, or you feel like God's called you to be a lawyer, God knows the legal system needs some really good, <laughs> really good, honest, uh, you know, saints of God in that industry. So, if you feel called to go into those areas of of life, pursue excellence through education, but knowledge is the difference between deliverance and destruction. And so pursue, pursue good knowledge. This podcast is made possible because of listeners like you who are willing to bridge the gap. We now have a sponsorship program on our Anchor website in which you can become a monthly sponsor of $1, $5, or $10 a month. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook.